Okay, good evening. We're at my exhibition at Trading Boundaries in Mid Sussex. It's just been renovated. <laughs> we opened on the 1st of November. It looks a fantastic, it's been a fantastic job of renovation. And sadly, we had to close again a few days later. But the exhibition is still here and hopefully it'll still be here after lockdown. In the meantime, I'm going to walk you around the pictures. Uh, this is a print. We're standing in front of a print of um, the drawing I did for Uriah Heep's Magician's Birthday. And it was their second album. And I was given literally 24 hours to do this. And I had to figure out a design. I had to figure out a design that I was capable of executing in maybe three or four hours and how I could put the whole package together in the 24. So this, uh, the original of this probably took me what I hoped it would about three hours to do. And I got the, um, it's interesting, I have it here. On the album it was turned, it was turned to red and the sky was specified to the printers. And then there was a couple of little features that were drawn on a separate drawing that went in at the printing stage. So it, it was a, a bit of an assemblage, but it worked very well and it allowed me to do something very bold, very quickly. So this is roughly the size of the original. Over here is what I've redone it for BMG now releasing Magician's Birthday and this is their, the new album. The figures are separate. This is the original painting. There's no figures in the original painting. The figures are separate drawings and the reason they're separate is I was going to do them in different positions for different iterations of this. So it's, it was, it's been great for me. Uh, it was wonderful having the opportunity to redo it. Um, it's available. What I showed you there was from the box set, which is a spectacular box with every single Uriah Heap album in it, and three of mine, three of my covers. So, <laughs> and that's out now. And this was done last year, actually, not this year. I was about to say this year, but it wasn't. It was last year. Um, I'm going to move on from this, but I just want to say one sad note both Ken Hensley and Lee Kerslake died this autumn uh, Lee died in September and Ken died on the 4th of November so it's a sad time for Uriah Heap but it's a the Brox is a good tribute to all the work that those guys did with the, with the band so Goes with the wall and the fireplace, I think. <laughs> what we have here was an interesting challenge for me because Freya, who's living in Tokyo, uh, talked to me about coming back to England. She managed to come back 
exactly at the end or of when it was possible to do it. I think she was one of the last passengers flying out of Tokyo and almost empty airport, almost empty aeroplane. And I said to her, don't come back just to keep an eye on us, which is what her plan was. I had come back with a project. And she suggested that I do things live on the Facebook site. And this was the first painting I did. This was for the Yes uh, Live album from the uh, Royal Affair tour. That was a fantastic tour. Michael and the guys from Trading Boundaries came with us and we exhibited everywhere the bands went. And I say bands in plural because there was Arthur Brown uh, performing with Carl Palmer's band, there was John Lodge, there was Asia, there was Yes, and it was a, a, a terrific load of fun actually. We had a great time driving all over the States. Anyway, this is Yes's live album from that tour. And as I say, Frere twisted my arm into doing it live, which was a weird experience for me. But these sketches were done very quickly. There's three of them here. And I suppose each one took a few minutes. But I loved the energy and the way they look. So I was really satisfied with that. There's another sketch here where I was trying out a different idea. It doesn't have quite the dynamics of these three, but I, I still love them. They're very quick. In the middle here is almost a totally different idea. And I was working on this in parallel and thinking that the two ideas should work together. So this is a rock formation illuminated from the inside. And this was the cityscape in the distance. And I had the notion of calling it something to do with the glowing in the night. So we've called it possibly permanently a glow. Um, anyway, very quick sketches and I love them for their energy and dynamics. A more thoughtful version of the rock formation that was going to end up in the painting. I painted these with having the minimal amount of paint on the brush, white paint and the blue mixed together on a, on a, on a dark background. So when I did the squiggles, I didn't have to add white. It was there already on the brush. So very quick. The same again here, but a, a bit more of a tangle there with the colors. And again, there it worked. I, I, I was really happy with the energy and the feel Everything about those work for me. But I'll move on and have a look at the final painting now. I hadn't really intended at the beginning to make it into a snowy landscape, but it kind of ended up being that way. I quite like working this size too, because I've been working almost exclusively at six foot by four foot, big, big canvases, which I love doing. But this was more manageable and I like that. And I don't know if you can see how close you can see, but if you can see in here, I had a great deal of fun building layer upon layer to get that texture. And then painting the illumination from the inside. So these were done live. So somewhere on my website, if you're curious, you can find these being produced. And I do remember that was some lady asked us if I could put a, a cat in. So the cat is in there. And this was a, a river pathway going into the city. Sorry? <laughs> yes, imitating an owl. I 
I'm going to walk around the corner now. Are you going to follow me around? No, I'm too transfixed by this painting. <laughs> Good. I haven't seen it before, I think. I'll follow you. You haven't seen it before? This one, no, I haven't. Oh, oh no, because of course it was Freya doing the filming when I was doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There's, I might stand over here. There's two paintings here, one on that door, which is, um, but I'll, I'll talk about this one. This is uh, interesting for me because I did this and I was asked by some people working on a VR project. Ooh, they came down and set up a, in my studio. Oh, which was it? Magic Leap? Or could it have been Magic Leap? O Oculus Rift? I can't remember which particular technology it was, but it was in the very early days of it. And it took all day to set up. And I thought, who is going to buy something that takes this long to set up? But when I tried it on, it was brilliant. It was just fantastic. I couldn't believe it. I really loved it. So I was quite excited about the idea of working in this way. And I was asked if I could develop more of this landscape. What does it look like over here or down there or up there? So the painting that you've just seen actually was based on a bunch of sketches I did of the painting of, the, of this landscape developing. And I, and I did a great deal more drawing to the right of it. Um, the equivalent of probably 10 more canvases if I painted it all this size. When I was doing it, I, I like the kind of anthropomorphic feel to it of, a, of a, a character hanging and leaning towards an infant. So it was, I, I thought it had a sense of a mother and child but it also had a feel of a crucifixion. So those two ideas were banging around in my head when I was painting this. So it's rock, but it has a kind of human feel about it. And again, like the painting we've just looked at, I really enjoyed the textures I was able to get into the painting. I shouldn't encourage anyone else to do it, but I like, I like the physicality of the paintings. <laughs> And this was for a band called Bird Songs of the Mesozoic. And um, yes, so we had to have a couple of birds in there to be the source of the songs. This is a while ago. This was 17 years ago I did this painting. And the band, bless them, played at an exhibition I had in a New York gallery they came along and played. That was really wonderful. But a while ago now. Over here is a painting of a green wasp in a double helix shell, which originally was done at the same time I did the Relaya painting. The camera is gradually coming this way. <laughs> of its own accord. There you go. Yes. So, oh, what's that dark band across? That's just a comment. Ah, oh, I see. I see. Okay. It's very rare for me to actually see the screen side of the camera. <laughs> right. So I've been drawing these in parallel with um, Relaire. And when I redid the uh, project and called it what I thought it had always should have been called, the Gates of Delirium or Gates of Delirium, I did do this as well. I hand did it onto one of the prints as a special commission. But um, yeah, it's always been part and parcel of the Gates of Delirium project. That looks like it should be the initial 
initial sketch for the next Marvel superhero. <laughs> Did you get a, can you get a close-up of the mm. textures? Yeah. I can feel how rough it is. So this was a, a commission. The finished piece for the client who commissioned this was actually a painting, but I liked it and I, I, I thought it would work very well as a, as a drawing. So this is the drawing. Sometimes drawings take a great deal longer and have a great deal more work in them than paintings. Paintings, it's easy, you, you're putting material down in large quantities. Well, Drawings tend to be a fine line when you're applying them. But I love it. I love working in ink, in black and white. So whenever I get the chance, I, I really have fun doing it. So this painting was done for Rick Wakeman's Myths and Legends of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Rick, what a bloody mouthful that title is. <laughs> anyway, it was again fabulous fun doing it. The waterfall is a waterfall I walked to in Scotland and um, yeah, we we discovered it from above. So it wasn't a question of walking upstream because the path wandered inland. So when we came to the waterfall, it was from the position of the night here on horseback when I first saw it. And it was a very lovely waterfall. And I'm glad I have a chance to incorporate it into a painting. And all the root systems here, the trees are ash, very old ash. And the root systems, although they are supporting ash trees, are, were all sketched in a forest, or a woodland at least, called Mark Stakes Common, where they have a great many hornbeam. So all the root systems are based on hornbeam, and the trees are ash, ancient ash. And in the background, pine trees. So if you can see in the top right-hand corner, a hint of Camelot. <laughs> I, I'd say, like I've said for the last two paintings, I'd say the same here. I love the textures that I was able to get. Can you come in and have a look? Oh, you have a look at close look at the night as well how many hidden nights are in this painting sorry how many hidden nights are in this painting ah uh, they're all hiding you have to spot them um, how, this is the, have a look here then too I shouldn't encourage people to touch these. I like touching them though. Only you're allowed. Yeah, that's how. That's what I think. Are you reading out the questions? Yeah, people. Are, uh, this is the first question. So. Ah. Um, oh no, it's just a nice comment. No questions. Everyone's just listening. <laughs> well, it's always fun working with Rick, and this was a reeb re-recording actually of um, the album and uh, yeah great fun working on this I've sneaked in a bit from various sites in Scotland so I would say 
this is mostly Scottish bits of Scottish landscape as opposed to the West Country, Devon and Cornwall. Okay, it's very similar in colours as this painting here. And, and what I like about this is that there is no element of this that wasn't real. Everything, the trees, the, this tree, the moss, the owl, there's not an element of fantasy in this painting, it's all real. It's a symbol in a way that isn't exactly like anywhere you would necessarily find. But all the bits, this cluster of trees, um, I've repeated them and looked at them from different angles, but they are all from a site very near my studio. Um, there's a junction at a place called Beddingham, and it's slightly more inaccessible now. But 20 odd years ago I was there and I photographed the trees because I thought they looked very neat in the way they were expressing the direction of the south southeasterly wind which is the predominant wind direction we have on the downs and the tree here is partly from a uh, bonsai and the owl my plan, um, I did a painting um, called The Old Bridge, which had an, a European eagle owl in it. And I love painting that bird. I went and visited it at Carla Lane's Animal Sanctuary, which is actually only a couple of miles from the gallery. It's in Horsted Keynes. And um, well, sadly, Carla Lane died a few years ago. But before then, I spent time there drawing owls. And uh, this one, though, I wasn't able to get to Carla Lane's for this one. This one was owned by a neighbor. I have a neighbor who um, I met on a regular basis as he walked by our barn. And uh, he used to go out on the downs with a falcon. And I told him I was looking for an owl. He asked him if he had one. And he said, oh no, but I know where one of your neighbours has one. So we went round there and this was the owl. It's the same as the owl in um, the old bridge. It's a European eagle owl. And sadly, and I don't really understand why, because we're very enthusiastic about immigration into England, and yet eagle owls are not allowed to go free. So if they're found here, they end up in sanctuaries rather than turn free, which I think is very sad. They're a spectacular, wonderful creature. Amazing. This one does look like he's stamping his foot in irritation. In actual fact, this was not a still, I, I didn't draw him like this. This was from a photograph we took of him bouncing around inside the um, enclosure he was in. So he just deflected himself off one end and was turning. And I just thought he was spectacular. Very beautiful creature. What's your take on signing paintings? Or if someone's pointed out they can't see a signature or date on the paintings? Oh, that's right. I never used to. And nowadays, I'm so used to not signing them, I forget. So whenever, if ever we sell one, I, I always have to make sure it's signed. But when I exhibit them, they aren't necessarily signed. You're quite right. How the hell did you notice that though? I could have been very discreet and said, I actually carved my initials on the other side of this bit of wood here. And the dates. Why don't more artists who commission you to painting an album cover actually buy the original painting afterwards? Well, 
that's almost never happened perhaps maybe twice ever so it's yeah it's um well <laughs> ask the artists yes 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 i'm the wrong person to ask certainly the wrong person to answer that question and i i have to say though i'm very satisfied with how kind the bands are to the paintings yeah i guess they're focused on the music what can i say it's a it's a mystery so this was done for the yes fly from here album and again i just enjoy doing that black and white drawing and it it was terrific fun giving it credibility as a creature and then holding to the yes absolutely to the yes logo at the same time for me by the way i'm not touching this it's got glass on it because the paper ones are much more vulnerable than the um, paintings on I say on canvas they're actually on linen what I liked about this one was the head once the head was done and the eye in particular it suddenly looked ah right this is going to work I've got to be careful not to wander off because I'm kind of tethered to you in the camera. Okay, this, this was done for Osobisa and um, I made models of the elephants with the tank heads when I did the first Osobisa album covers and they were never used. But um, I was asked by Thomas Nielsen of Repertoire Records in Hamburg. He wanted to do a box set of all their single releases, A, a and B sides. And he wanted something done in the style of the original Osobisa album cover. And the original Osobisa album cover was a pen and ink drawing in black and white and then coloured. So that's what I did here. So this, this is a a pen and ink drawing tinted with a minimal amount of colour and the background painted. So this is done in exactly the same technique as the original Osobisa. Um, I like it but I do find some people are a little bit disturbed by the idea <laughs> of the tank heads on the elephants out there hunting poachers. It's a very labour intensive way of doing a picture. It's, I, I've said it already tonight, but paintings are much quicker, much easier. But I do enjoy that. This, I enjoy the, what can I say, the meditative process of drawing, or maybe endless small marks and just building up the texture and the evenness of the tonality of it or tweaking it. So it's, for me, it's a big deal. I love doing that. And we're edging towards the end of this room and going into another room. This is a watercolour here. It's a, it's a colour study. It's a colour study that did appear in its final version on Steve Howe's album or Steve Howe anthology ah so we're now on a very much more noisy floor and you can hear the sound in this room so this was um, a painting I did for the class for the online class so that eagle head was just a demonstration painting. It wasn't for any other purpose, just done for fun. 
Uh, that doesn't make sense because I think most most of these were done for fun. So in this room, apart from the eagle and the Astra logo, can you see the Astra logo? So apart from those two, everything else in this room is a print. And we have the European eagle owl at rest in this picture here. And below it, I was talking about it earlier, this is the print of the painting called The Old Bridge. And there is the eagle owl in the print. So this is a limited edition print, that's an original, and that there means it's been sold. You want to, I was going to say, if you want to take it off the easel, off the tripod, but no, it's probably okay. So these, most of the prints in here, apart from that one, which is just a straightforward limited edition print, most of these are hand finished. Now, when I've hand finished this one, I've not added anything in the way of, a sub, of subject matter. I've just intensified the colours. I put layer after layer of transparent colours in here to just make it that much more vivid than it would have been if it was just a plain printing. So some of the prints, I just intensify the colors and some I add features. This one here, which is, okay. So again, sometimes I've added rocks into versions of this print but mostly and I should just explain it's done on very heavy watercolour paper 380 grams so it's very heavy watercolour paper and if I paint into it it doesn't buckle so that's one of the joys of this really heavy paper and, and what I've done here is again I've worked on intensifying the colour with layer upon layer upon layer of transparent colour so in terms of time on this, probably I'll spend, I don't know, three, three or four hours just building up the intensity of the colour in here. And what medium do you use when you hand finish a print? Well, because it's heavy, I can use acrylic. I use acrylic paints. On these two that we've just talked about, you know, they come in opaque or transparent, they come in all kinds of different versions of the same colour. But with these two I've been working almost exclusively in the transparent colour range. You seem to feature a lot of bridges in your painting. A lot of? Bridges. But are you particularly drawn to bridges? Yes, I, I did an exhibition called Pathways and Bridges and I've done an exhibition called Islands and bridges, so yes. <laughs> Do these two have airbrushed skies? Well, it's a print, so the sky is printed. Um, uh, did the original painting have an airbrush? 
I don't know if it did. I can't remember. No, I can see. I can see brush strokes in there. I'm glad it looks like it was airbrushed, though. It might have had. It might have had the final thing, evening out, the top of the sky, because that was done in um, ultramarine blue, and ultramarine is incredibly prone to show an unevenness. So it, it probably had to be evened out. But the colours down here are much more opaque and much more amenable to being gradated and worked on. But the, yeah, I definitely suspect that the top was done. Now way back in the early 70s when I did that painting there which was called Pathways, that definitely had an airbrush sky and the original painting for years no no it didn't for years for a while had cat prints because the cat walked across it I've got to get the timing right on that because I actually painted those out very quickly but because I'd had it photographed on 10 by 8 transparencies the posters the album cover the cards the pages in my book they all had the cat prints but when people see the original and say, where are the cat prints? I say, well, <laughs> might have been cute, but it annoyed me. <laughs> I had to go. This painting here is my very first album cover ever. Um, I just finished at the Royal College of Art. I was asked to design the interior of Ronnie Scott's Jazz Club and Ronnie Scott and his partners Pete King and um, Jimmy Parsons had gone into the business of managing bands, mostly jazz bands but in this case a rock and roll band called The Gun. And they asked me on looking at my sketchbook because they were curious about the origins of the designs I'd done for their club. They asked me if I would develop one of the paintings for an album cover. So that got me started. That was the very first one. And that was done for a, a, one of the biggest record companies in the world, uh, CBS, Columbia Records. And they got bought by Sony. So it's later became Sony CBS and the person who is head of A&R at, um, at uh, CBS was David Howells and he left soon after and I did a few jazz covers for Ronnie Scott and Vertigo but then I was thinking I really want to go back and do rock covers and I looked up David Howells he'd moved to MCA and he gave me the Osobisa, the first Osobisa cover, and a bunch of others as well. But uh, so it was a good change of direction. And the, the Osobisa cover did me a massive amount of good. Um, it's sort of unheard of, but a store in Oxford Street filled its window with the Osobisa cover, and the owner of Big O Posters, Peter Lederberg saw it there and uh, his story is that he contacted me and asked me to do if he could do it as a poster my story is I contacted him and asked him if he would do it as a poster anyway whoever's right the upshot is I started doing posters of my early work and we sold huge huge numbers literally many 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 millions of posters So we have two here. That one is called In the Forests of the Night and was for an Asia album cover called Omega. So they did an Alpha and an Omega. Alpha not being their first and Omega not being their last. <laughs>
So this is a reworking of close to the edge because the original got damaged. And this is a hand finished print. And in this case, I'm not enhancing the colors, but I'm adding trees. So this, the trees are new, the, these very foreground trees have been added. And each one is different. So the hand finished prints, each one is different. And sometimes I get commissioned to do specific things in them, which is a lot of fun. Hmm. Okay, this is an unusual print, I just noticed, because here it's got something looking vaguely like a Gothic cathedral, and then there was a version where I had something looking like a pagoda and a final one that looked much more like my own architecture. And they can be seen, a, a blow up of this little area here can be seen on the um, album. Now, what was it called? From a Page. The Yes album, From a Page. This was done for the opera, Edgar. Um, it's a Puccini opera celebrating his 150th anniversary and Freya and I worked with them for nearly a year. And I did the sets and she did the costumes and we worked together on a poster. Her work isn't on the print, but on the poster she added a lot of the figures she designed the costumes for. So this is um, done for was a box set called Progeny and it, there was, uh, Yes did a box, a triple album called, um, my mind's gone blank. Um, ten songs from seven, seven to seven. Yes, that was what this was called. The original one was recorded live at the Rainbow in 1972 I think in December 72 these were recorded in 73 in America and this the box set has four I think complete concerts the album that I missed the name of was Yes Songs of course with the triple album with a book in it we've got a few minutes left so I'm going to just have a quick look around. This, this exhibition, we've looked at two rooms. There's a whole bunch more. And what I'd like to do is just show you the stairwell and say we'll come back next week and look at other rooms and the week after to wrap it all up. But I think we might just get a glimpse of the stairwell before we finally close for today. A sneak peek. Yes. So can you follow me? I can. We've got a door here. Ah, I've got it. We can't spend a lot of time here, but you can see there is the original of um, the, from the Forest of the Night, and that's a Blue World painting done for. Um, a global warming project for Hank Rogers and a drawing of the painting a glow halfway down the stairs and up here some smaller prints
So we're going to say good night now. Thank you so much for joining us and we are going to be here next week, same time next week and look at the rest of the building. And I think we are going to finish and then record Tracy introducing the exhibition. So we got this in the wrong order. Thank you so much for joining us and I hope you join us again next week. Thank you. It's a fantastic exhibition.